Come with me to a magical place where being labeled the pork queen is a compliment, where being nice is just a way of life, and where all leaders of the free world must pass through. Welcome to Iowa. Whether you're a current Iowan, an Iowa expat, or an Iowan at heart, this show is for you. This is the Iowa Podcast. Real Iowans, real talk, no drama. I'm Justin Brady, and did you know you have a 1 in 366 chance? I just did all this research. A 1 in 366 chance of getting in a wreck this month. And you have a 1 in 107%, or excuse me, 1 in 107 chance of getting killed in a car wreck in your lifetime. Now, you don't don't skip back. Don't skip back. I'll just repeat it. 1 in 107 chance. Roughly. I did the research a little bit. I was doing research frantically this morning because of today's guest, Scott Marler, the director of Iowa Department of Transportation. I don't, I don't know if you brought this data with you, but is there, are these numbers, you know, generally correct? Does, does this sound familiar to you? Because that's really shocking numbers. Yes. Shocking is the right word. Yes. We have a crisis, Justin, with traffic safety in Iowa, for sure. We saw the last uh, Five years, the highest numbers that we've seen in the last five years, 377 fatalities on Iowa's roadways. But if you look across the whole nation, absolutely, it's more than 40,000 fatalities just this past year. It's just, it's nonstop. Yeah. Um, And, you know, obviously we're going to talk about the numbers in Iowa because the numbers went up a little bit uh, and why that is. And, you know, I'm going to take a couple guesses as well. But uh, for, I didn't even say thank you for coming on, coming on again. <laughs> so thank you so much for coming back in the uh, the studio. Yeah, my pleasure. So good to be here with you today, Justin. <laughs> really quick reminder for everybody, always trying to give you very current information that's actually helpful in Iowa, of course. So make sure to go to iowapodcast.com to find all the podcast badges and subscribe. Of course, it's in Apple. It's in Spotify. It's in, I don't even know what Google's doing these days. They like close Google Podcasts. They're moving it over to YouTube something, but it's everywhere. We'll stay on it. We also upload to X, by the way, formerly known as Twitter. So, yeah, the the Iowa like rates of fatalities increased, uh, according to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. We're in the top three percent now. Of excuse me, we're at the top. Like we increased uh, in fatalities a little bit. The we increased at 11% and the country is at about like 4% increase. That's right. Well, here's the big question. 300 some in 2022, 388. Realistically, we have a bunch of people on roads. We're trusting each other constantly to not hit us and kill us. Realistically, can we really do better? I know, I know what you're supposed to say, but can we really do better than 388? Have we kind of hit a... Uh, a cap in Iowa, and I guess that's my big question. Realistically, can can we do better? The answer is 100% yes, we can do better. Um, 2022, it was 356. This last year, 2023, 377, just right. to talk the numbers a little bit. And you're right, that was a significant jump mm-hmm. compared to the rest of the nation on a percentage basis. So in Iowa... That 377, the way we look at it is every fatality is a serious problem. So that's 377 too many. Can we do better? Yes. Now let me give you a little, another little statistic yeah, while we're talking about please. it. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration has put a statistic out there that 94% of crashes are attributable in some way to human error or human choice. Mm-hmm. In other words, we're bad drivers. <laughs> That's really that's really what it means. Yeah, yeah. Right? So can we do better? Absolutely. We can do a whole lot better. Now, the department at the DOT, we're doing our part to try to help drivers navigate the system better, make sure that people are getting where they need to go safely. So from an engineering perspective, yes, you, you've seen some new things just out on the roadway. Diverging diamond interchanges is one example. We've mm. seen a few of these around the state. Why are we putting these in? Well, one reason is we know them to be a lot safer mm. compared to a standard diamond. They also move a whole lot more traffic more efficiently. So from an engineering perspective, the cable medium barriers, the rumble strips, the pavement markings, you see many things across the state where, yes, the department can, can engineer some additional things and construct some additional things, but really it's a partnership. It's a two-way street. 
Drivers have to do their part as well. Buckle up. Put the phone down. Control your speed. You know, these are ways we can do better. We all have a choice, Justin. So can we do better? Heck yeah, we can do better. Let's choose to do better. So you're, you're talking about engineering roads and scenarios in such a way where people, even if they do stupid things, um, aren't killing someone else or themselves. The, like, how yeah. far can you take that? You mentioned rumble strips. You mentioned the cable, uh, mm-hmm. the, which basically slow, de- they decelerate mm-hmm. and get your car stuck so you can't cross over and hit anybody else. Um, what other engineering decisions have you been making in the last five years to combat these trends? Yeah, you, you've probably seen a lot of things uh, across Iowa, but maybe not connected them back to some of the, the safety uh, uh, choices that we're trying to help drivers navigate. So one example would be we intentionally have uh, the area outside the shoulder of a road. We call it the clear zone. We intentionally make sure that it's essentially clear of any obstruction so that if an errant vehicle happens to get off onto the shoulder, they have a very good chance at navigating back onto the roadway Mm. safely. That's Mm -hmm. the point of that. Roundabouts are a case where we know we're seeing a lot more roundabouts in Iowa. Yeah, people seem to hate them, though. I know. (laughs) But does this make us safer, though? (laughs) Well, and and I would say lately it's mixed, you know, mixed reactions to that. The answer is roundabouts have been shown through national data to have an 82% reduction in fatalities. Really? Really. They are way, way safer. Is it just because everyone's really confused because they're new and they slow down and they're like, I don't know how to do this? Is that the real reason? (laughs) Because the people are going slower for sure. Yeah. Um, But yeah, we are needing to um, teach a lot on, you know, how a roundabout works and what it's really about. But they do, they're very effective at keeping people safe. Um, There are portions of the state Um, even some right here in Des Moines that have gone from what's called four lane to three lane conversions on um, some kind of heavier arterial type streets where they intentionally, instead of having two opposing lanes of traffic, they might have a uh, a three lane scenario where there's a middle turn lane and perhaps some bike lanes if there's room. Uh, Not only does this help with uh, multimodal transportation, but it just keeps people safer because there's more opportunities to navigate uh, more congested neighborhoods with a four-lane to three-lane conversion. These are just examples of the the steps we're trying to take at the department to engineer roadways that are safe. So let me get back to what you said about safety. There's something called the safe systems approach. The One of the fundamental ideas of the safe systems approach is people are going to make mistakes. Mm-hmm. Right. How can we engineer roadways in such a way that accounts for that? People sure. are going to make mistakes. Right. So let's just engineer them to account for that so they can stay safe. Right, exactly. And that's that's very difficult. Like, but, you <laughs> yes, know, they talk is. about um, one of the design thinking, or I, I was reading this book about efficient leadership and efficient design thinking mm-hmm. recently, and they basically said a lot of the problems that companies experience is they plan for 100% perfect execution all the time. They don't plan with slack in mind. Mm-hmm. They're like, it's not like, why are we planning to be like that, that all our plans are going to always go correctly when we know they're not? He goes, so the best entities, organizations, companies always plan for slack. And so essentially that's what you're doing is saying, we acknowledge people are going to make stupid decisions. Even mm-hmm. the smartest person is going to make stupid decisions. We're going to engineer roadways in such a way where when you, make a stupid decision it's not going to harm someone else's that's the idea okay because in you know if we just did roundabouts everywhere i can tell you right now that would probably drop the number to zero because people wouldn't know how to drive anymore (laughs) so we could just do that it's a balance (laughs) yes (laughs) um so what are the real i know the mpo is doing a survey right now Mm -hmm. i'm not sure how successful that will be but do we have i'm sure you have an inkling and data sets on what the real reasons for that increase is um yeah. what are some of the core reasons that you're like every time you read your report you're like there it is again if yeah. people would just learn blank we wouldn't have this issue so what we know from the data in iowa is that the most of our fatalities are occurring on rural two-lane roadways and this obviously is reflective of really? who we, yep really who we are as a state wow. they're called lane departures and mm. lane departure could be due to a whole host of act, you know, actions, but 55 mile per hour roadways, uh, rural on the, what we call the secondary system. These are primarily county roads. So what are we doing to help this situation out? And I will say this past year, we saw something we had not seen a lot of 
we saw multiple fatality crashes. Oh, yeah. So when you really? when there are crashes where there are multiple fatalities, we saw an uptick in that as well. We know that there are still a lot more motorcycle fatalities mm. than we'd like to see mm -hmm. uh, in Iowa. That's another concern, of course. Um, so with these things in mind, several of the ways we think about it, not only from the engineering. So if you look at rural two lane roads, we're looking at putting centerline rumble strips on all of our oh, rural wow. two lane highways. Okay. Uh, we have the edge rumble strips significantly in a lot of places already, but we're looking at that centerline rumble strip as well. The rumbles that make the noise when yeah, you drive over. Yeah, definitely. Not only does this help people, uh, you know, if they're drowsy, not only does it kind of wake them up a little bit, but think about in winter conditions, it helps you navigate a little more easily too when you can feel where that where that uh, center Good line point. is. Yeah. So that's a that's a safety feature there. Um, the the other thing with rural, particularly rural, but I would say even statewide at the DOT, we're looking at six inch wide pavement markings. Now, you may not think that's much, but when you're navigating the roads, uh, a fresh six inch marking just jumps out at you a whole lot more than currently now, what we what, use now a what lot does of that mean? Uh, just like the center is, is six inches wider or they're so thicker lines? All the lines or? on the pavements, all the markings okay, on the pavements. Okay, got it. So we're, gonna, we're looking at increasing the, the yeah. size of those. The width of those are typically four inches wide. Got it. So we're going to six inches wide for the edges and the center skip dashes and solid lines in the center of the lanes. So these are ways that we're looking to really enhance the safety profile of a lot of our rural roadways. Yeah, and I have a graphic design background, actually. A lot of people don't know that. And uh, information architecture and graphic design really dynamically changes how people interact with their environments. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think a lot of people, uh, well, I always say, because I used to be in advertising and design, we don't want you knowing how design works. But uh, people don't know a lot of their design decisions, or excuse me, a lot of their decisions they make even at the grocery store are made because designers positioned and design products in such a way to get you to grab them. You know, so when someone, when I hear you saying going from four inches to six inches, I think the general public was like, that's not going to make a difference. But design decisions like that that surround you mm -hmm. make a far bigger, dis, uh, a far bigger impact on someone than they may realize. Is this, we often hear like the, the boogeyman of road, which is like speed, seatbelts, mm -hmm. uh, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Do we have data on people are going faster or people are playing fast and loose or they are not wearing their seatbelts. Do we have any data like that th yeah. of the change in the last year? It, it's, um, let me start with speed. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So just this past year, 2023, the Iowa State Patrol issued nearly 1,200 citations for vehicles going more than 100 miles per hour. Now think about that a minute. 1,200 citations, more than 100 miles an hour. This, the little bit of winter we had in January, those 10 days of blizzard-like conditions, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Uh, during that storm, the state patrol stopped one, someone going 93 miles per hour. They oh, stopped gosh. another vehicle going over 100 miles per hour. In those blizzard That's conditions, crazy. it is absolutely crazy. The, the next day after the, uh, the main part of the storm, I drove over to Iowa City, and that was kind of the focal point for a lot of the really yeah. bad mm -hmm. weather. The interstate looked like a just a graveyard of jackknife semis, yes. just in the median and the ditches and things. Yes, and I just saw a video to, of that. Yeah, it was crazy. It was crazy. So to imagine someone going 100 miles per hour in those blizzard conditions, this is what we're seeing, and speed has not abated to the levels we, we really need to see it come so down to. So do we see, again, I, there there's may be a point in which I ask questions, you don't have the d data that's granular enough to give me an answer, and that's okay. Are we seeing higher speeds then last year? Is, is that one of the primary reasons for, yeah. for, for additional fatalities? It, it's, yeah, certainly speed-related fatalities are sure. a big concern. It's kind of a pre-pandemic, post-pandemic phenomenon. Mm. Before the pandemic, that same statistic, speeds in excess of 100 miles per hour, six to 700 citations a year. What? Yeah. Wait, so, so we'll go, we'll, we'll, okay, and now 1,200 or something well, like that. The year I don't after, what the number you know, was. the year immediately following, yeah. you know, the pandemic, it was it was like fifteen hundred. What? Yeah. And so then the pandemic we, caused in some bizarre thing. The pandemic, like, was a catalyst to people driving like almost double the double their speeds before. <laughs> the roads were wide open, no traffic, <laughs> and for whatever reason, people seemed to they just went for it. That's you know? crazy. 
Okay. Okay. All right. So we we had an Audubon moment there. Uh, do, <laughs> is this persisting? Like, are people still driving fast, or was it like during the pandemic the roads were open, yeah. so people were flooring it and testing out their new car? Like, has this returned to normal, or are people still speeding like crazy people? We're not back to normal. Really? And, and I think most earth. of us, when we drive, we can see it, right? When yeah. we're on the interstates and other roadways that we're on. So the state patrol, um, we've worked with the state patrol and the Governor's Traffic Safety Bureau to set up some safety corridors across the state. The six highest problem locations across the state. Um, we put up some signs and we're having additional enforcement, working with local law enforcement partners. Speeding is one of the big issues mm. in these safety corridors. Really? So we're just trying to bring those speeds down. And we don't know why that is, though, just because, like, right now, the roads aren't open. And so it's just some weird habit left over from, were there that many of us that were going that <laughs> fast where it had this big of an, I mean, I know I know it wasn't me. This is why I say we have a safety crisis. We really, the, the choice is in our hands, Justin. I mean, we yeah, can choose it. Crazy. We can choose to drive safe. That's the bottom line. Outside of, like, well, okay, well, not outside of, is impairment a growing issue as well? We have, um, I'm not saying this isn't a political statement for or against marijuana, but it's here. People are using it. Yeah. Is that impacting drivers more than it used to? Um, is, is that an issue? Uh, the cell phone thing, we'll get into mm -hmm. that here too, but let's start with impairment. Is this a bigger issue than it used to be, or we're not really seeing much of an increase there? The, the impairment is always an issue, and yeah. it's always a concern when somebody's driving impaired. Uh, we haven't seen dramatic increases That's good. In, in that. Uh, really, the distraction is really more of a focal point here lately. Uh, but it's hard to hard to track distraction because even on the police report, who's going to claim that they were on their phone if right. something happened? True. You know? yeah. But we do know anecdotally stories, uh, sad stories of fatalities where um, you know, law enforcement will find the phone in the floorboard of the vehicle that crashed. And it was running a YouTube video, for example. Oh, gosh. You know, so we, we have very sad stories just like that um, with distraction. And that's really what is the biggest concern to us. Just this, earlier this spring, when we were getting some warmer weather, the DOT, we were thinking, let's get out and do some, um, some painting of, of lines on the pavement uh, to kind of get an early jump start. And when we do that, we set up several trucks in a row, yep. mm -hmm. uh, kind of a train, if you will, of trucks to, to, um, to not only protect the paint truck, but also allow a little bit of drying time. Well, sure enough, a vehicle pulled in between some of our trucks and, and struck our paint truck. And fortunately, everyone was okay. But again, why are people making decisions like this? A big part of this, we believe, is, has to do with distraction. When you see fatalities where... Someone, the, the police report says someone ran the stop sign. Why would somebody run a stop sign, especially you know, on rural roads where you have rumble strips now yeah, yeah. leading up to the stop sign? Well, we can kind of connect a few dots and, and uh, suppose uh, that that had to do with distraction. Not always, of course, but I mean, that's kind of the logical conclusion with some of these things. Because we, you, you'll have to remind me, we do have a law on the books about like texting while driving. Correct. Right? But yeah. now that doesn't include using your, like you can still use your phone legally in the state, right? That's correct. And is this, yeah. the, is this, I know that uh, Axios reported um, this, at least where I was, I'm, I'm sure multiple news agencies reported it, but um, that there was a legislation that didn't pass on distracted driving cell phones while driving. Was this a complete flat out ban that didn't pass? Like absolutely no cell phone in your hand while driving? Is this what didn't pass? That's correct. We, we call it hands free. Yeah. That's what did not pass is a piece of legislation that um, would require hands free use of your cell phone while driving. There are a few states across the nation that have passed hands free. Right, right. And those states are reporting uh, a lower level of distraction related mm. crashes as a result of of legislation just like that. Sure. And so obviously that's for lawmakers to decide that's that That's for the stuff. legislature to decide. Right. But in your view, um, in, a, in a perfect world, because there are legal issues, whenever you do, whenever you have a law, right, there that impacts people negatively and positively. Mm -hmm. But just from the data side, would we see lower fatalities in the state if we said, hey, everybody, absolutely no cell phones. I mean, so, you know, there's a, there's a spectrum here, right? We'd also lower traffic fatalities if we told people no one's allowed to have cars, 
you're all done, we're done. Um, you, you have to walk yeah. down. You know, so yeah. there's always a spectrum. But if we were to pass something like that, would we see lower traffic fatalities, do you think? We believe the answer is yes. We would see fewer fatalities if we, if we had a law that uh, prohibited uh, cell phone uh, distraction. And part of that's rooted in uh, national data. You know, mm, it, mm-hmm. there's national data that shows that uh, 30, 34% of crashes had cell phone interaction Goodness. just before the crash. Wow. So if you kind of connect those dots, logically, we think, yes, there would be uh, a reduction not only in crashes, but in fatalities as well. Yeah, I remember uh, I did it once, right? I've done it a few times where I was like checking something and then um, like I noticed I was like in the middle of the line mm-hmm. and I was like, oh, that was a wake up call for me because mm-hmm. I was like, I can multitask. I'm a pretty sharp guy. And then I was like, I, that's, this is this is pretty darn dangerous. And I think everyone's kidding themselves when they're like, oh, I can take a glance at it. Or, oh, I'm, I'm, you're kidding yourself because sometimes, you know, you sit on your chair at home and you scroll through Twitter or whatever and you're like, what? I've been doing that for 20 minutes. You enter like this time warp that you're not really <laughs> familiar with how much time is passing and I think people think it's going to be a glance that's going to be one to two seconds, but that one to two seconds turns into 10 or 20 seconds. And before you know it, you're in a ditch or you're smashing into another vehicle. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a, a very difficult issue. Doing all these engineering things, is there a point where we don't even need to do any of that? Like, because, you know, we already have yeah. like full self-driving has been in the news. Tes- Tesla was in the news yeah. because someone was, you know, killed uh, in full self-driving and uh, I was having this discussion with someone again on on Twitter or X or whatever we're calling it and they were like oh full self-driving is just is just too dangerous I'm like dude humans don't even know how to do full self-driving we haven't even figured that out yet Um, and so are we like from a from your perspective are you excited about full self-driving cars or or is your office still like you know, the jury's out on this one. Excited. Yeah. Yes. But let me tell you why I'm excited. Please, please. There are, there's a statistic from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration where, where they looked at the promise, the potential of high levels of technology in vehicles. And that promise is an 80% reduction in crashes. Woo. Yeah. 80%. Wow. So let me couple these things. Humans are bad drivers. Yep. And... The technology can help us drive a whole lot better. Yeah. You put those two together, you got a win-win. Okay? Right. Now, let's talk about Tesla a moment. Full self-driving. The Society of Automotive Engineers, SAE, have different levels that they rank the level of automation right. in a vehicle. Right, yeah. A Tesla, that, those levels, by the way, go from one to five. Level one is a full human driver. Level five is... Full-on automation, you don't even need a steering wheel right. or pedals in the vehicle. Which doesn't exist today. Does not exist. Yeah. So a Tesla is a level two, mm-hmm. okay? So this word, full self-driving, um, there are no fully self-driving vehicles on the market at all today. There's only one model I'm aware of that's even a level three, and it's not a Tesla. It's mm-hmm. a different manufacturer. Um so we're in a progression toward this advanced technology, and we're not even close yet, Justin, to, to realizing that. And I think that's part of the issue is the way that when people see these words, they think, oh, I should just be able to take my hands off the wheel and sure, do nothing. Sure, That's not the case yet. Right. It may be one day, but we're on a journey here to get there. Yeah, and to, to Tesla's credit, there's, there is, like you said, it's a mixed message because they say full self-drive and F- FSD. They're in FSD beta right now. Maybe that's the way they, you know, they, they frame it. But they do say eyes cannot be off the road when you're using this. And the car will penalize you if you take your eyes off the road, and it will revoke your full self-driving. But at the same time, they call it full self-driving mm-hmm. at the same time. So you can see where there's maybe a little confusion for people. But, um, yeah, so you're – do we have at least for – well, I don't know. We'll call it level two, assisted driving, computer-assisted – uh, I see wild videos mm-hmm. of, uh, I'm a Tesla fan, so I watch those videos. I'm sure there are other examples of mm-hmm. other autopilot cars. I remember I drove a Volvo S90. It was a rental, but it had autopilot. And it, I, it again, you, they, you had to keep your hands on the wheel. It, penal, it got mad at you if you didn't. Mm-hmm. But I was, we, we did a long journey and it kept it like perfectly in the lane 
for just stretches and stretches with zero driver. It was incredible. It lowered driver fatigue by a lot. I got to where it was like a seven hour drive. I got there and I was like, I could go another 12 hours. This is crazy. <laughs> and so um, within those cars, are we seeing, and I don't know if you have the data on this, but within those cars, is it almost shocking when there's an, when, when there's an accident caused by these level two, uh, maybe level three cars on the road? Does your office look at that and say, how, how, did, that, how did that happen? <laughs> Well, the Surface Transportation Board is the one who, who really looks closely at that. We, several years ago, when, with the kind of the emergence of this idea of vehicles that could fully drive themselves, there was a thought um, people will, m- maybe initially, they're not going to trust the technology a lot. And yeah. especially if there's a fatality, they're really not going to trust the, the technology a lot. Um, we're beginning to see the leading edge of, you know, there's been so many miles driven now by some of those companies like Waymo, for example, mm-hmm. that's yep. put so many miles on self-driving cars that we're beginning to kind of see a repeatable pattern here from a safety profile. And the data is suggesting that they do drive better than people. Oh, yeah. So yeah. We, you got to think about, yeah, when, when a human crashes, you know, we, we, we feel terrible and we, we mitigate the circumstances and we do what we do. When a machine crashes, we have zero tolerance yep, that's for a true. machine crashing, right? So we got to get this right, and I think it's just a matter of time, honestly, before we do. It's a matter of control, right? You know, if, if we were in control when the car crashed, somehow that's okay. But if a computer did it, it's almost like, well, the computer murdered someone. You know what I mean? They're, they're out to get us, and we think about Terminator and, you know, <laughs> and st- yeah, scenarios like I that. Know. Kinda. You know, I've always, I've always imagined that it's going to be kind of like... Um, as rare, like auto crashes are going to be as rare as airline crashes. Like we, where, you know. Yeah, that's that's what we hope for because, as you know, the safety record with the airline industry, airplane industry is very, very good. At least in the United States. Well, at least actually, the globally, it, yeah, you're, right. you're absolutely right. It, it's, the, a, it's a great safety record, and that's what we want for automobiles, too. We want that kind of safety right. record for driving on our nation's roadways. Right. Do you think that in, like, 10 years or so, um, car crashes are going to make national news whenever they happen? Do you think that's pretty close? I think we are going to see significant advancements in the technology in the next 10 years. Yes. We're already seeing the leading edge of these things through innovative companies like Tesla and others who Mm -hmm. are doing a whole lot in this space. And I think we're on at the leading edge of this thing, Justin. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's kind of what I see um, very soon. I mean, you know, obviously we have to give time for other cars to, to age out of the system, but I imagine pretty soon um, we will be reading in the front page of the papers like car crash kills two. Like that'll mm-hmm. be national news because people mm-hmm. are like, how could this happen? Mm-hmm. This shouldn't be possible. What you know, we're going to have investigations uh, going to be launched when car crashes happen. Just like you know, if an airliner goes down or has an issue, there's a huge investigation. Even these little cowlings that fell off of an airplane. Um, recently, like huge investigations get open for this stuff. I think that's kind of where we're going. I think you're right. Do we believe in it enough? And again, there's this whole your thoughts and then there's legislation. Mm -hmm. But do we believe in it enough where you see local states, maybe cities incentivizing people to go autopilot with like tax incentives or stuff like that? We're not there yet, uh, I would say. Now, keep in mind that our legislature um, did pass some legislation uh, a few years ago, which uh, made it legal to to have driverless operation in the state of oh, Iowa. Oh wow! Yeah. Okay. So that's already part of our of our uh, policy fabric here in the state. Um, but from a local ordinance perspective and a local kind of uh, management of of cities and towns across the state, I think there are still some questions to wrestle with, particularly like robo taxis and mm-hmm. yeah. and curbside service and things like that. That I don't think we're quite there yet. Yeah. And do, like, um, is, is there any infrastructure concerns um, for, like, everything being autopilot, everything being full self-driving? Like, do we see no stoplights, no road signs anywhere because the car networks will be doing this? Like, what from your, I know you guys yeah. are looking at the future yeah. of this. So are, are you making plans or here's what we're planning in the next five to 10 years, because this is probably going to reality, be a reality. Here's how roads and here's how infrastructure needs to change. And what does that look like? It's probably be the last question, then we'll be out of time. Great question. And the answer is absolutely yes. We're looking at something like this. 
We call it the two-prong approach. So what can we do for humans today and for machines tomorrow? Those six-inch wide payment markings I mentioned, not only are they good for people today for safety, but machines can read them better. Oh, the optics, the cameras, the LIDAR, the radar, it can see those markings better. But we need to go further than a machine can because if a machine just can view what a human can view, they, they're not seeing over the horizon. They're not seeing around the curves. That's what we want them to do. So what kind of data feeds can we be providing to those machines that's saying around the curve, here's a condition you, you need to be aware of, vehicle. Not only that, si road signs. Is there a future where maybe we don't need as many road signs? Yeah, that might future might be out there. Think about the electronic message signs that you see along the interstate, the overhead. We call them dynamic message signs, DMS. If the messaging is going into vehicles in the future, do we need that type of messaging out on the system? These are great questions that we're exploring all the time. Yeah, those could be just really high bandwidth data I mean, everyone's going, most of these cars are like cell phone or satellite anyway, but mm -hmm. uh, maybe those go away and those are just really high for high transfer data, data areas where cars are uploading and downloading d real time data about the road conditions. You know, I like where your mind's yeah, at. The, I mean, that's what planes do right now. Like um, people, your, your, your captain gets on and says, hey, there's turbulence coming up. I'm going to have to ask you to belt up. And you're like, there's no turbulence now. How do they possibly know that? Well, they have instruments. They look at weather reports. But most people don't know. They they call up to the pilots ahead of them on the same trajectory mm -hmm. and say, what's it like up there? And they're like, hey, it's pretty shaky. You should go to, you know, a couple thousand feet. And they call ATC and ask, hey, do I have permission to do that? You know, so they're communicating with each other. It's within reason that cars will do that automatically for us in the future. Um, I should point out 59 fatalities this year so far. So if that trend, obviously, probably more fatalities in the summer but if that trend stays on, it looks like maybe we'll be back to better numbers this year. Is that the hope? Yeah, and, and I did check this morning right before I came in, Justin, yeah. uh, 64 just as of this morning. Okay, okay. Yeah, and uh, that is 18 below where we were last year Got on it. this exact day. So, yeah, we're trending better compared to last year, but it's not far enough yet. I get it, yeah. The number one, Justin, if I could leave your listeners with this, number Please. one thing. Like, somewhere to say, well, what's the number one thing we can do? Choice, your choice. We're going to engineer the roadways. There's going to be enforcement available. There's going to be education. There's going to be emergency medical services. But really, the choice is in your hands. Make that choice to drive the speed limit, to buckle up, to not drive impaired, to put your phone down, your distractions down. Make those choices and we'll all arrive alive. That's our hope. Scott Marler, director of the Iowa Department of Transportation for the state of, well, yeah, Iowa Department of Transportation. <laughs> Iowa Department of Transportation. I don't need to say the state of <laughs> Iowa. That's in the name. Uh, thank you for coming on the Iowa podcast again. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Justin. It's been a pleasure. And to my fellow Iowans, Iowa expats and Iowans at heart, thanks for listening and subscribing to the Iowa podcast. Podcast.